This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hello friends. I'm here with another interesting case. This is from my library. The surgery was done in February 2019 and I just bumped into it while I was searching something else and I just thought it was worth sharing it with all of you. Uh, this is an elderly lady with a mature white cataract and is scheduled for surgery and it does look innocuous and a routine case, nothing suspicious about it. Uh, the surgery is being done under posterior subtenance anesthesia. The side ports are made, uh, the anticapsule is stained, ovaries injected into the eye and the posterior limbal 2.8 mm incision is done. Rexus is initiated and using a forceps the rexus is completed. It's quite good, central, round and about 5 mm in diameter. Looks alright. I'm not doing any hydrodissection in this case. I'm just trying to check the mobility of the nucleus. Usually I just do that. It's sort of a habit for me. At this moment I'm attempting to rotate the nucleus with a chopper. And this is a mature cataract. It should rotate easily but surprisingly it does not. I noted and I found it very unusual but still I thought it's nothing alarming so I move on. I plan to do phaco emulsification I mean, uh, introduce my phaco tip into the uh, eye. As a routine I begin aspirating the superficial epinucleus but something unusual happens here. The nucleus tilts up suddenly. Uh, it looks as if it is saluting from within the back. Now I said to myself hang on I thought this is suspicious. I put in more viscoelastic trying to settle it down. Now looks alright again. Back with my phaco probe. Again as I'm aspirating the epinucleus the scenario repeats itself. The nucleus tilts up again. Okay and now I think this doesn't look good at all. It looks ominous. Uh, at this point I believe uh, that there is an underlying posterior capsule tear. Now is the time for the backup plan. So my plan is to convert to manual SICS and uh, remove the nucleus. I quickly shift to a superior position as I prefer to perform a, a fresh sclerocorneal tunnel incision in such bailout situations. Conjunctival flap is created. I fashion a small scleral groove posterior to the intended position of the planned scleral incision. This is just for me to stabilize the globe while performing the scleral tunnel. The sclerocorneal tunnel is being created using the crescent blade. Uh, we can clearly see here that the plane of the corneal tunnel which is being created now is below the plane of the original side port incision. A 6 to 7 mm sclerocorneal tunnel is created uh, as I'm expecting a bigger nucleus. The anterior chamber is entered with the help of a sharp keratome and the inner lip of the sclerocorneal tunnel is extended laterally on either side, always taking care that the inner lip always runs curvilinear and parallel to the limbus. The first thing I do now is to inject dispersive OVD uh, below the equator of the tilted nucleus. Uh, this is going to help me in two ways. Uh, first would be to push back the vitreous if there is any and also to provide some sort of a barrier effect to tamponade and prevent or minimize uh, the vitreous coming forward temporarily. I need to prolapse the nucleus out of the bag which is quite tricky because of the size of the rexus which is relatively small compared to the diameter of the nucleus. But I am reluctant to enlarge the rexus since I thought it was a perfect size to achieve optic capture of the intraocular lens when I need to place the lens in the sulcus if the situation demands. I am using two Sinsky hooks like chopsticks to dial the nucleus out. By manual mobilization of the nucleus out of the bag is an extremely helpful uh, technique to deal with such situations. Half of the nucleus is out of the bag but is still is stuck in the rexus now. A little bit of OVD is injected around the nucleus. I am mean, trying to figure out how to go about now. Uh, the easy way out is to just enlarge the rexus but I am not keen on that. So want to try one more attempt. The nucleus is gently maneuvered out of the bag. And I retract the rexus margin a bit. Uh, with my Sinsky hook and then the nucleus is easily wheeled out of the bag into the antechamber. 
Now OVD is placed under the nucleus first and then above it. Using a vectus and a dialer, the nucleus is expressed out using a phaco sandwich technique. The remaining epinucleus is again visco expressed out. Now I can see some of the cortex and loose lens matter is behind the area of the capsular bag in the antivitreous. So I suture the main incision tenonylon suture, a temporary one. Diluted tramsinone acetate is used to stain the prolapse vitreous. And in this case, I've decided to perform a past plan antivitrectomy, which would also help me to have better access to some of the uh, lens matter in the antivitreous. About 3 mm behind the posterior limbal border, a past plana incision is created with a 23G MVR blade. The irrigation is through the temporal phaco incision and the vitrector goes through the past plana port. The anterior vitrectomy is begun and in a couple of minutes the prolapsed vitreous is taken care of. And some of the cortical lens matter is also cut and aspirated. The PC tear is very huge. Now I can visualize the margin of the end of the tone posterior capsule. The PC tear is very huge and this is the other end of the tear. So it has been a huge equator to equator split in the posterior capsule and probably this was a case of a posterior polar cataract or something like that with an inherent weak posterior capsule and the PC tear happened probably during the early stage of the surgery during my initial attempt to rotate the nucleus. There is no history of an intravitreal injection given for this patient. Now before implanting the IOL, I want to confirm the absence of any vitreous in the anterior chamber one more time. Tramson acetate staining shows some vitreous fibers still tugging at the main wound. The cutter is used from different angles to deal with these fibers. Now vitreous has a great knack of fooling us and invariably sneaks us to the main incision and that's the reason I usually stain it a couple of more times before implanting the lens and also before closing the eye. Now remaining lens matter is removed using the Simco cannula. Finally, it looks good and clear. Now I'm creating some space above the anti-capsule and behind the iris by using sodium hyaluronate, a multi-piece hydrophobic acrylic lens. The same one which was originally planned is gently slid into the antechamber and then the distal haptics are first guided above the excess margin. And then the proximal haptics are dialed over the anticapsule. Now the entire lens is in the ciliary sulcus above the plane of the anticapsule. The OVD in front of the lens is removed by just irrigation. The OVD behind the lens is removed using the vitrector to the past plana incision. The superior sclerocorneal tunnel is self-sealing but still I am suturing it with a tannon nylon suture to prevent worsening of the pre-existing against the rule astigmatism of 1.2 diopter. So care is taken to ensure that the suture is not tight and this is critical. Otherwise we end up inducing more with the rule astigmatism. Now the past plan incision site is sutured with a single etovicral suture. Using the vitrector, I go behind the lens one more time just to remove any uh, remaining OVD. But now I can't leave the lens just like this. It needs to be locked into the place by achieving optic capture in the rexus. With the irrigation in my left hand, maintaining the chamber, the optic is gently pushed back until we see the ovalization of the rexus, which confirms the optic capture. By locking the optic of the lens into the capsular opening, we can ensure excellent long-term stability of the lens and also excellent refractive outcome. Finally, the conjunctiva is closed with the etovicral suture.
it's important for me that the eye looks good uh, at the end of the surgery. It doesn't matter how long the surgery goes on. So finally, it does look all right uh, in spite of a major intraoperative event. And the postoperative period, she did quite well and the visual outcome was perfect. To summarize, it's very difficult to diagnose an underlying postocapsular tear in the presence of an overlying nucleus. It's extremely important to be aware of the subtle signs which may hint that all may not be well. And these signs, as in this case, would be uh, just difficulty in rotating the nucleus and tilting up of the nucleus. Uh, both of these signs were very much obvious in this case. An experienced eye can pick up these subtle changes very easily, but a novice surgeon may miss them. So the dictum for an inexperienced surgeon would be, when in doubt, always convert. By following this principle, the novice surgeon has the best chance of preventing a nucleus drop in such a situation. So thank you for watching and hope this helps.